wonderful to see this historic context of uh, experiments in sustainable communities. And tonight we're going to be hearing about a real evolution and very, very different concept of what a sustainable community is. This uh, new nascent collaboration with Cooper Union's Institute for Sustainable Design has already catalyzed an intensely creative conversation between our two institutes and we are just so delighted to be working with you and to have the opportunity to begin to develop programs like this evening for our increasing ever widening circles of communities. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that the shared purpose of accelerating the understanding and implementation of whole systems solutions and design strategies to achieving a, a really enduring sustainable future is absolutely critically critically needed. Um, it's at the heart of what we do at the VFI um, and it's urgently needed in our colleges and universities. And Cooper's unique focus on architecture, engineering and art provides a, a very interesting, potent, fertile ground for these ideas to take hold and find radically new cross-disciplinary form. I wanted to just uh, recognize that Allegra Fuller Snyder, Bucky's daughter, is with us here tonight. So I'm just delighted <laughs> to have her here. So I can't think of a better way to kick this off than hearing from our speaker tonight, Michael Benelli, who's been at the leading edge of breakthroughs in sustainable design for over four decades. I, I had the pleasure of meeting Michael um, in first met Michael in 2005 and he had recently completed the publication of what he calls the five core principles of sustainability and they were written in response to what Michael recognized as the increasing dilution of, and lack of clarity around a definition of sustainability and the need to advance a, and restore some rigor to what that definition is and what the underlying ideas are and to offer up a core set of principles and their operational implications. And we'll be hearing about these tonight, their concrete application in a remarkable uh, desert community project. So Michael has served as a senior advisor to the Buckminster Fuller Institute since 2005. In that role, he's conducted in-depth de research on Fuller's concept of comprehensive anticipatory design science. Uh, which has served as a conceptual framework for all of our educational programs. He was a very important advisor on the formulation of the Buckminster Fuller Challenge, our annual design competition, and, and served as a juror of that challenge. Michael was a student and very close collaborator of Bucky's for, for many years, involving both the Chattas Dome Project, but also uh, research into advanced structural systems and the exploration of issues related to the management of technology and world resources to benefit all of humanity. Uh, he graduated from the Architectural Association in London and later received a PhD from the Institute of Cybernetics at Brunel University where he studied under Gordon Posk. Um, he went on to pioneer applications of system thinking and cybernetics in management and organization and has spent many years focused on strategy development, organizational design, and change management. Uh, in the last recent years, four to five years, his work um, primarily relating to the issues of sustainable development, inspiring leaders in business around sustainability, also in the government, community, and students, led to his founding of the Sustainability Laboratories in 2008, I think, and, um, and to the development of Project Wadi Atir, which we will hear about tonight. So it's, it's been a great, great personal pleasure and honor to get to know Michael and to learn from him. And um, I'm just delighted that you're here. Please w join me in welcoming Michael Benelli. It really feels like home. I mean, with all these uh, so many friends in the audience here tonight, and all the history, 
And another thing, it, it's really, uh, I, I feel excited about uh, being here. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you for the organizers for putting it together. Uh, I, I want, to, again, to mention Allegra, who is here. This really uh, makes me shudder to, to think about what I need to <laughs> keep up with now. <laughs> Uh, but I also wanted to recognize a very good friend and colleague, uh, Joshua Arno, who is here in the audience. Uh, Joshua has been an instrumental bridge between the BFI and what I've been doing in the last few years. Uh, Joshua's family are the lead funders of uh, Project Wadiatir that you'll hear about an, until now. And uh, Joshua and his sister, uh, Ruth, have been really instrumental in, in uh, funding the work of the lab and everything that you'll hear tonight is possible before that, so Josh, thank you very much. Um, uh, what, what I, 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 I was told many times that the secret of a good presentation is to have one idea with three bullets or something. <laughs> so I, I'm going to err on the, <laughs> I'm going the other way and I have much too much material here which I'll have to rush through uh, and you'll excuse me for the, the, the kind of quick talking. Uh, what I wanted to try and do, however, is take you through a journey that I've taken myself uh, that really has been inspired from the beginning from all my association with Fuller. Uh, the, the thing that I'd like to try and integrate is three different, not different, in, uh, certainly uh, related, but three uh, concepts. I want to talk a little bit about design, but in an entirely speculative manner. I want to talk a little bit about sustainability and hear more in a theoretical way and then get to what you tier if we get there uh, that will give you those speculations and theory embodied in actual uh, activities um, uh, on the ground. Now, Bucky would always encourage us to think big, right? So we'll start by going to the context of things. Now, this here is a very remarkable picture uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the Hubble telescope, all the pictures that are coming from it and how exciting they are. This one here is a very unusual situation. This is the deepest portrait of the universe that humans have penetrated. This is looking back to 400 million years after Big Bang. You, you, you see how the vision here takes us also back in time. It's a fantastic journey and you see here the first galaxies to emerge after that, uh, after that time. Uh, it's about 10,000 galaxies in this particular picture, and it's a very narrow uh, spectrum. You know, it, it's, it, it's about the, the aperture of about tenth of the, of, of the uh, diameter of the moon. So it's a tiny, tiny speck of what we are surrounding, our, our environment, if you will. Now, this is especially significant, and remember the number, 10,000 galaxies here. It only not much more than 100 years ago, we thought that the Milky Way was the cosmos. Mm. Hubble was the first to uh, point out to another galaxy. I think it was, an, I can't remember the name, but another galaxy outside of this. Now, when you look at this situation, what is happening in this incredible totality, um, it, it's fascinating because here you've got the picture of the Swan Nebula. Uh, these are basically uh, 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 dust clouds which are gas and, and a gas cloud that are shaped by ultraviolet ra radiation. The scales here are enormous. This is like uh, about three light years across this picture and it's 5,500 light years away. The reason why I'm showing this to you is that these are the hotbeds for star formation. This is where young uh, massive stars are, are being formed. These are the factories of, of stars. This is where things are born all the time as we speak and as uh, now, there, there are many regions like this. Another very well-known picture is the gas pillars of the um, Eagle Nebula. Again, a factory of making uh, uh, stars. All areas of star formations. Here is another extremely exciting picture. This is not a simulation. This is an actual photograph. It's a photograph that was taken by uh, Adam Krauss and his team at the Institute of Astronomy in Hawaii. And this is actually a picture of a planet information. You have here a, 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 a solar system information. There's the sun in the middle, uh, surrounded by these gigantic dust uh, clouds. And it, that, that little thing in the, oh, I have a thing here. Wait. Ta -ta -da. This is actually a planet information. 
and uh, astronomers are able to compute its age. This thing is young. <laughs> it's the youngest planet in our, uh, in our experience. It's about 50 to 100,000 uh, years old. Now, when we look at all of this, when we look at that cosmic environment, it appears that there are two types of major things going on here. There are regions of diffusion and, and spreading of energies, and there are other regions of compounding of energies, two completely different directions. And if you look at it, of course, the Earth is one of the most spectacular compounding energies regions uh, that we can experience. This is where order and complexity are being formed. Uh, complexification in the sense of Tilar de Chardin. Uh, and all of this in increased order really manifests itself in the sequence of formation of complex molecules, appearance of organic uh, molecules, appearance of life, whole ecosystems, and of course consciousness itself. Now when you think about this, this all of this is happening against all odds. If you are a scientist and somebody will take you say, show you a, 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 a how should I say, like a, a, a cubic mile of space where you won't even have one, on average, one hydrogen atom and tell you, go and, and predict, compute the, the, the possibility of life, compute the statistical uh, probability that that will happen, every tell you zero. And here we are with the ability to think about all this, the ability to penetrate all the way to the beginning of the cosmos and we still don't appreciate what we are in, 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 in that regard. Uh, the possibilities there, of course, and the responsibilities are, are immense. Now, we have here then two fundamentally different, um, we talked about this uh, 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 consolidation and diffusion. There are basically two types of uh, uh, processes. There are entropic processes which diffuse, which uh, uh, where orderliness is run down, if you will, according to the second law of thermodynamics, but at the same time, we've got areas where order is being created and order is being uh, as, as manifest by all these processes that we talked about. Now, the, the interesting thing here is human mind is probably one of the most powerful uh, tools for order uh, creation that we know. I know that we create a lot of mess, including this image here, but basically, this is the potential that we have. And I think that this is where uh, perhaps the, the true meaning of, uh, of being human uh, may be. So when you look at this kind of situation and think about some of the ideas that we talked about, you have here an incredible dynamic, constantly changing system. And it means a number of very important concepts that I'd like to touch on first is that this the, the, the reality, what we call reality, if you will, can be th seen as a, a, a dynamic cloudoscopic uh, flux of intertransforming events, right? The clouds become this, become that, become this, become that, explode again, become this, going to a black hole, don't know where they come on the other side. I'm sure we'll learn much more about this uh, continuity of this picture than is realized today. What it means is that reality continuously reorders itself. It's in a continuous process of, uh, of, of um, reordering. And the key point to make here is that human activities and human potentialities are, are really part of this gigantic self-organizing process. You know, we like to, all, all the conventional way of thinking about the cosmos isolates us from it. We are here and there's something that is happening out there. But basically it's one process and our capabilities are one of the agents in, that in this larger, uh, not unlike any other component uh, uh, in it. So the, one of the, of course, interesting thing is, is that the imminent order that is, uh, that is part of all these things, imminent order in a sense that is uh, expressible in what we call physical laws, the laws of physics and chemistry and so forth, is accessible to the human mind. We are able to observe that thing and understand the major patterns and express those patterns in those uh, uh, physical uh, laws. Now, the idea of order creation is certainly at the heart of the concept of design. This is what design is about, creating order. And it entails the consciously kind of applying intelligence to arranging, rearranging, and optimizing 
preferred configurations, arranging, rearranging, and optimizing all the bits and pieces, the building blocks of universe, uh, in some preferred uh, consideration or, or a, a, a configuration or another. And this process is latent in nature. This is what nature does all the time. And it's latent in all humans. And in that sense, really, we are all designers. We are all have this potential of participating in evolution itself. And certainly, we have to begin to see ourselves as agents in shaping reality. Now, the idea of being agents to shape reality is, is deeply rooted in some of the uh, uh, familiar uh, 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 wisdom tradition, uh, the Kabbalistic idea of uh, fixing the world, uh, the Buddhist notions of uh, taking care of all sentient beings, all of these are behind that recognition that there is some special power here that can be, that if it were completely manifest, if it, would, if it will allow itself to completely manifest, could really create some uh, gigantic uh, uh, miracle. So, with this in mind, we can, uh, uh, we can see that in a general sense, design, w when you strip the notion of what style and what shape and what period and whatever, design has to do fundamentally with the process of arresting or reversing entropy. This is what it is about. And this is a beautiful definition, I, I can't even remember where I found it, uh, but design is the deliberate challenging of energies which otherwise would be diffused. You've got all this incredible tendency of things to diffuse, to uh, increase entropy, and you have this capability of mind to understand what is going on and, and increase the, the, uh, the trajectory of uh, uh, consolidations in, in order. And I think this perhaps, that notion, if we think about it, is this is the meaning of being human. <laughs> this is what it means. This is what humans are different than uh, many other things. The, 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 the exertion of that uh, potentiality. Now, the notion of deliberate implies the idea of purpose. Uh, it, 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 purpose in, in a sense of having a series of steps leading from intention to realization. So we can think of design as really the process of uh, realizing uh, intentions. And when we look at the world today, with all the, the challenges that are all around, uh, what does all this mean? That really, that the worldwide transition to a trans uh, sustainability regime is the ultimate design uh, challenge. Uh, th this is really what humanity is being called uh, upon to participate in that design project, what Bucky called design revolution, and bring about uh, some order in the mess that we are uh, creating. Now, that, that brings us to the idea of sustainability, and it's a word that has been bandied around, as Elizabeth noticed uh, earlier, that it's almost lost its meaning. So I'd like to take a minute just to focus, before we go to how it's manifest in something like Project Gladiateer, I'd like to just to say, what do we mean by sustainability, and what are the underlying concepts that, that have to uh, support it, if you, uh, if you will. The first concept that is important is to realize is that the idea of, of sustainability pertains to a balanced interaction between a population and a carrying capacity of an environment. This is what it is about. It can be any environment, any population. It can be amoeba in a petri dish or, or lions in the savanna or humans on the planet. And this interaction has a very interesting uh, uh, aspect to it in the sense that the two sides of the equation, the population and the carrying capacity, continuously affect each other. It's not a linear process, it's a dynamic, circular uh, situation. Uh, populations obviously modify their environments, and the environments are what makes a particular population uh, possible in, in, the, in the first place. In fact, the whole history of the biosphere is a history of emergence of species that continuously modify the very composition, chemical composition of the atmosphere for uh, a, a example that made possible the emergence of other species and so forth. So the idea that this is again that same dynamic system that we saw before of things continuously affecting each other and being affected by the process of affecting. Now when you look at the, at the situation of humans on the planet in, in a, in a, in a you, if you increase the resolution of this cycle here we get something like this. Uh, you have the population on one side, the carrying capacity on the other. Obviously, a population at every instant 
uh, is defined by a, a whole complex, a, a complex interactions of things like birth rate, fertility, growth rate, death rate, mortality. All of those, incidentally, are things that are still not completely understood by demographers. Why things go like this. Uh, but nevertheless, the population exerts its impact on the carrying capacity of an environment through its activity. And the activity really takes shape of two ch main channels. One channel is the demand on resources. In effect, the, uh, any population feeds on its environment. And the other channel is the generation of byproducts. All physical processes generate some byproducts, and the process of using resources and, and living uh, generate byproducts. And those byproducts have to be able to be absorbed by the uh, uh, an environment, what we call, in this case, uh, 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 sources and sinks. Now, what is happening in our time, of course, is that that dynamics, that equilibrium is, is, is out of whack. We are over, uh, over exploiting resources in a way that is faster than the way that they uh, are able to reproduce. And of course, we are overwhelming the oceans and the forest and the air and everything else with bi toxic byproducts uh, that are a threat, a threat to um, life uh, itself. So, with this kind of a, a context, this diagram in mind, the definition that I would propose for sustainability is as follows. Uh, sustainability is a dynamic equilibrium, that particular dynamic, that's what has to be preserved, that equilibrium, doesn't matter how, that equilibrium. The dynamic equilibrium in the process of interaction between a population and its environment, such that the population can develop to express its full potential, we're not putting any limitation of what can or should it do, other than without producing irreversible adverse effect on the carrying capacity of the environment upon which it depends. And you see that that definition has the same circular aspect that I tried to characterize before. And it's an important definition in the sense that almost, uh, not almost, every part of it can be uh, quantified. We can certainly talk about the, 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 the scope, the amount of population, we can talk about rate of use of resources, we can talk about rate of, of polluting, uh, uh, and, and, and we can even introduce some qualitative manners uh, as, as Bhutan is trying to do, but well-being, happiness, as a, there's no reason why we should not count smiles as a, as, a, as, a, as a measure of how well we are doing or, or something like this. Now, this definition is, of course, very different than the prevailing one, which is... Uh, uh, is pegged to uh, cross-generational equity. You know that uh, sustainable development is development that takes care of current needs without jeopardizing future generations. That uh, definition, if you really contemplate it a little bit, you'll realize it has no operational meaning because it's, it's open to any kind of interpretation that you like. And that's exactly why it was chosen, incidentally. This definition emerged in the context of the bilateral, the UN, where decisions have to be done by consensus, so you always have to seek the lowest common denominator that everybody is agreeing. No one will say I'm against future generation, but it allows everyone to go back home and continue what they're doing now uh, without uh, much uh, uh, change. So the, the it's again the, the, the challenge that we have to design for is to restore that equilibrium, basically. Not restore in a, in, a, in a conservative way of going back to something that was before, but restoring that, ra that, that uh, ratio. That is the point here. And that ratio is, re is defined and redefined each time. That ratio for a Neanderthal man in a cave somewhere is completely different than humanity on the planet today, and, 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 and so on. So, you look at all this stuff now, all the, when I say uh, being out of whack, what I mean is all the, what we see is, we call them usually environmental issues. They're really not environmental issues. Uh, issues like the climate change and, and loss of biodiversity and uh, the threat on, on palatable water and uh, all, all the things that are, are the major problems, the way major world problems are really symptoms of, of, uh, of that losing that equilibrium. And you can ask what is going on here. And it seems to me that there are perhaps uh, a three essential perspectives on it. One is to say there's really no problem here. And that's uh, still, unfortunately, the prevailing view uh, of, of politics and so forth. Uh, and and uh, say so just business as usual, the science really that is not there, ta, 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 we have to do more research, we don't know, 
Of course, it's all um, reflecting current interests that, that uh, are vested in continuing things as they are. There is another perspective that is uh, true to many uh, environmental economies, for example. Uh, and there they say uh, Earth was large and human population was small. Now society and the world and, and the human economy is, is larger than the planet, so to speak. And we need four planets unless we reverse where we are and go back. Uh, the problem with that uh, uh, concept is I don't think that there is going back. <laughs> you can't, you, uh, you know, it, it's very interesting. Some of the uh, best theoreticians who were able to uh, understand and, and, and project what is wrong with the economy that is leading us there came back with the idea of those pastoral, semi-rural communities uh, almost going back to medieval days. I don't think that the, the, the genie is out of the bottle. I don't think you can replace it. Which brings me to the third possibility, which fascinates me personally very much. And this is that all those issues that I mentioned, that I talked about a minute ago, are really symptoms of uh, blocked possibilities. Symptoms of something that they, is attempting to be manifest, and it's blocked by all the old ways of doing things. All our institutions and all the... The, the, uh, uh, all, all our way of decision making, all our way of thinking what is right and what is wrong, the values, and th these are all, they belong to a completely different era. They belong to humanity that had a completely different experience. And that experience, incidentally, is best manifest by this thing here. Uh, you're all familiar with this, and you saw it, the, 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 the huge explosion in, in uh, population. Uh, it's less dramatic if you look at this graph in the last 300 years. You see exponential growth since the Industrial Revolution, but nothing dramatic like this. If you take a look about 10,000 years going back, you'll see that humanity always hugged just below a billion until suddenly it spiked as it did. Now, the interesting thing is most of the discussions about the future by demographers tend to focus on the, on really on, on the, um, on the slope, oh, I'm almost doing it reverse, on the slope of the curve at the top. The point that I want to make is that the big difference has already happened. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what will happen here now, whether it's uh, at nine or 10, doesn't matter. There is no precedence of managing the world with 10 billion, 9 billion, 11 billion people. And all our, that, that's important to realize because it means that all our ways of doing things, as I mentioned before, are really not up to the task of, of doing, we need to integrate all of this. We need to really be able to integrate humanity in the way that was never done before. And there is no book, there is no manual. There is no expert on sustainability, nobody knows. And that's why we all have to think together and really make breakthroughs to, to, to get through this long jump that we are, are, are stuck a little bit uh, with. And it's important because that means really reviewing everything, you know, the, our worldview, our basic values, uh, the structure of the economy, the, the priorities of using of technology. Look at where technology is used today. I mean, the highest priority of using technology is in, in weaponry. And that's where the best science and the best design is going. We, we, we are able to design today, uh, you all know this, I don't have to say it, kind of <coughs> a missile that will hit somewhere 5,000 miles away in a bathroom while you are sitting in somewhere on the ground. Uh, it, it's really amazing technology, but that's not what we should be doing, perhaps. Um, and, um, and, and of course, governance and other uh, idea. All of these require second order change. It will not be enough to tinker with little things here and there. It, really, the system itself, and by the system itself, I mean all the things, the values, the economy, the structure, the, all of those things have to somehow um, uh, be able to change. And what is the objective of that change? Really, we need to uh, be able to foster a well-functioning alignment between individuals, society, the economy, and the regenerative capacity of the planet's uh, life supporting system. Now, that objective is true for any period in history, in any possibility. But how you do it, and what is the scope of the challenge, uh, is what is different. Remember again that, that one thing that remains always the same is that point of equilibrium that has to be uh, a, a achieved. So, we have that definition. And the next question is, what are the principles that, that drive, that are behind that idea of sustainability? What are the principles, if you violate them, you will not achieve it, no matter how you call it. It's a little bit like saying, if you wanted to, uh, uh, to fly and you wanted to construct some engine to take you flying, you better understand the principles of uh, aerodynamics. Otherwise, you end up like uh, uh, Daedalus and Icarus, right? 
Is that right? Um, so in the same way, if, if we're serious about instituting the concept of sustainability as an enduring state on the planet, what are the principles behind? And in thinking about the various variables that are related there, I found it convenient myself to cluster all of those into five domains of, of five something. And uh, uh, quickly, let me just put them on. The, 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 those are the five, the material, economic, domain of life, social, and spiritual domain. The material domains pertains to the basis, provide the basis for regulating the flow of energy and matter uh, that really underlies existence. This is the, the, uh, th those principles that I talk, the physical principle, not man-made principle. These are how the system work. This is what we need to understand if we want to be able to work uh, uh, with it. The economic domains pertains to kind of the guiding framework for creating and uh, defining uh, and, and managing wealth. The domain of life uh, really has to do with providing us with a basis for appropriate behavior in the biosphere. We're not alone here. There are many other species we're, we're decimating in a huge rate, so we're not very good neighbors. Uh, so the whole issue of biodiversity com comes uh, here. The social domain, of course, provides the basis for um, social interactions. And finally, the spiritual domain is the domain which identifies the necessary value orientation and really provide the basis for universal, universal code of ethics. So you mentioned ethics with sustainability before. This is the most important thing. Uh, the more I contemplate that, the more I realize that without that spiritual dimensions, all the rest is only techniques. And this is what gives us the foundation, the orientation, what we are. This is where that becomes manifest. Now this is very interesting because when I started working, it took me quite a while to work on this concept. And when I would, uh, this was in, in years that I was doing a lot of work with the World Bank and other multilateral institutions. When I tried to uh, get advice and expose this to people, everybody was telling me, don't even touch that spiritual thing. If you want uh, serious people to take you seriously, if you want to talk to heads of states or head of government, you know, put spirituality in, they will um, uh, wave you away. So for one, I would put it in and take it out, put it in and take it out, until I realized that without this, we're nowhere. Uh, so this is really the pillar. It's like the center of gravity. If you want, you can imagine this here. Here's an exercise. exercise. You can imagine this as a, as, a, as a tetrahedron, where you've got four of the things, the material, the economy, the social, and the life domain. And the spiritual domain is the center of gravity that really uh, holds everything together. So. The, the spirit, the, the, those five core principles relate to statements about each one of those. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go into the thinking behind them. So and what I'll do, I'll just give you a sense of how they are expressed, what they are. Uh, the first, of course, the material uh, uh, domain. Uh, but you, you, I, 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 maybe I'll say a few words just to link it. <coughs> The material domain is really ruled, if you will, by the thing that I uh, refer to as physical, as a, a, a law. Uh, right here you have uh, things like the, the uh, law of inter interchangeability of energy and matter, the famous E equals MC square. The first law of thermodynamics that talks about the conservation of energy. The second law about the direction of energy events and so forth. Uh, but this is also where consciousness comes in and when the, wh where the the application of intelligence to that physical reality is what makes all the difference. And the problem that we have today is that our whole economy is incredibly entropic. It's hugely wasteful. Uh, some economists that were able to compute it are saying that we are using energy at about 5% efficiency. It means that of every barrel of oil that we burn, not only we create all the, uh, all, all the byproduct issues, but 95% just goes in heat and smoke. So there is a great deal to do in reconfiguring the economy to become uh, uh, more sensible only from that physical uh, point of view. And the first uh, principle then says contain entropy, contain because you cannot reduce it to zero, you cannot eliminate it, uh, uh, impossible to violate the, the second law, contain entropy and ensure that the flow of resources through and within the economy is as nearly non-declining as permitted by natural law, so that the circle can continue, right? Without diminishing, without evaporating. And that brings us to the second one, the economic domain. And here also, perhaps, just a few words. Um, uh, when you think economies are about markets, in, in a sense, and markets consist of uh, uh, places where transactions occur, any kind of transaction, 
and frameworks by which we evaluate those transactions. Are we profitable or not? And the problem that we have here is that our current framework is completely distorting. It's, it, 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 it is that framework that leads us uh, like blind people into the wall. And it's distorting on a number of accounts. First, by emphasizing a, a very primitive concept of growth as it grows national product and so forth as being the goal of everything. Uh, as you know, the gross national product uh, measure is completely inadequate. In fact, it measures a lot of the worst of the negative activities as a good thing. When you have a, 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 a how do you call it, a, 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 a Exxon Valdez, right, the, the, this big uh, uh, disaster that took about a, what, about a billion and a half to fix or something, that billion and a half increases the GNP. So we look like we're doing better and better the more disasters we occur, uh, in a sense. But more than that, it really um, uh, uh, does, not, it, it does not take good care of what economists call externalities. We are not computing. <laughs> ten, mi ten? ten minutes? OK, ten, 15. All right. Uh, does not allow us to, to uh, does not take account of externalities such as uh, the, the cost of impact and depletion and so forth. So the, the second principle says adopt appropriate accounting system fully aligned with the planet ecological process and reflect true biospheric accounting uh, to guide the economy. I will just read the others rather than uh, talk about them, the domain of life. Of course, here you have the issues uh, of, uh, of the, the, the fact that the, the success of human uh, uh, experience on the planet goes on the on the uh, is being paid for in a sense by, by the, the destruction of many many species and here the thing is not about not doing good with a spotted owl the, what we understand now from science of complexity from general system science cybernetics is that complex systems are stable precisely because of their internal complexity and we are creating a, mono, a, a planetary monoculture both culturally and with respect to other species, which is a, a really going to uh, destruction. The social domain, oh, did I read the thing? How do you go back to something? Ensure that the essential diversity of all forms of life in the biosphere is maintained. This is very important. This is like a, a complete no-no. Uh, if, you, if you create big disasters with climate change, you can somehow restore by paying a lot for itself. Once a gene pool is disappearing, it's disappeared forever and you cannot um, uh, restore it. On the social thing, we'll just say you want to maximize degrees of freedom and potential self realization of all humans without any individual or group uh, uh, adversely affecting uh, any other. Again, it has that circular uh, structure to it, uh, which, which uh, is part of that story. And the spiritual domain has to do with that. In, in, in you see, humans are basically spiritual creatures with a driven intent to reach always for beyond, always to grasp for a larger um, uh, domain of integration. Uh, and here, perhaps I got a little bit too uh, poetic, but rec it reflects what the difference between this and the others. Uh, recognize the seamless dynamic continuum of mystery, wisdom, love, energy, and matter that links the outer reaches of the cosmos with our solar system, our planet, and its biosphere, including all humans with our internal metabolic systems, and the technological extension, the, all, all technologies, nothing but metabolic extensions, and embody this recognition in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, universal um, ethics. Now, all of these principles have a derived implication, and those relate to, uh, 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 first of all, you have to look at them as a system. You cannot isolate them. They're all integrated and interdependent. Uh, each one uh, uh, creates the others, uh, and you can see this if you contemplate that, that for a moment. Uh, and, and together, they really provide the elements for a blueprint for uh, the future. And they will include things like, uh, uh, you know, radical resource productivity and using, uh, 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 how do you say, income energies rather than using uh, fossil fuels, uh, and, and assume responsibility for other forms of life. I, I, I don't know if you realize sometimes what is happening when you get a, a UN report that says in 30 years there'll be no fish in the oceans. No life. You know what it means? Unbelievable. I actually had an experience myself. I went with a friend sailing across the Pacific uh, a couple of years ago. And he's an avid fisherman. And in, in, in the months that we were sailing, we were actually counting on getting fish. And we, and we were trailing for three weeks. Every day we caught one fish. And when we got to Samoa, we saw why. You have this gigantic flitting 
of, of uh, fishing fleets, of uh, factory uh, boats that go out in the ocean for three, six months and package them, and they go with 30 mile long nets and just got, got everything in sight. Uh, you can't go on like this, obviously. Project Wadia Tier, which we have five minutes for. Uh, no, we have. Take the time you need, Thank you. Project Wadia Tier is an opportunity and uh, an attempt by the lab to manifest those, four, th those five principles in a microcosm. It could have, might as well be the planet. It's really a small little things in the desert, but it, it would be the same for the plant as a whole. And it, it's, it's, it, in, in it, this, uh, this project tries basically to deal with, the, uh, uh, it's a community-based undertaking with the Bedouin population that tries to develop a model for a sustainable agriculture in an arid zone, as, which will fit, will contribute to the well-being of that population will be true for the region as a whole and for any arid, uh, uh, any arid region around the world. Uh, so we're trying to develop a model there. Uh, basically, the, the goals were, were threefold. One was to do something to contribute to the life of the Bedouins, a marginal community in Israel that has suffered a lot, so to make some contribution there. Two, to manifest those uh, five sustainability principles in a project on the ground, really. And, uh, and, and three, to create a model both for an agricultural operation in arid zone, but also a model for uh, a development process design, community-based uh, uh, development process design. Uh, this was very important for me because most of the project that I've seen in my years with the World Bank and other organizations like this, I was actually convinced that the whole approach to development project design is entirely wrong. It's lopsided. Uh, it has many, many faults with it. So here's an attempt to say, if I could isolate a little place, how would we do it uh, uh, right, so to speak? And this project tries to innovate on a number of dimensions at once. It tries to innovate on the technology dimension, on the social dimension, the economic dimension, uh, the spiritual in the sense that it's value-based. We created a value proposition that the whole community uh, subscribed to, uh, and, and, and so on. And this is significant in the sense that if you look at uh, sustainable development projects around the world, and there are many wonderful projects, you'll see that most of them tend to focus on one issue. It will be a project about water, or a project about energy, or a project about women, or a project about uh, children, or a project about something or other, but they'll all be in isolation, will never be uh, integrated into one whole concept, which is absolutely what is required if we're serious about that sustainability. Really. I've seen situations where uh, I did some work, I'll give you an example, one, uh, uh, in Central America, uh, for the bank, with the bank, uh, with the idea of trying to integrate some of the economies there into one situation. This was the years, was about, uh, I think, early 90s or something uh, like that. There were about four and a half billion dollars of bank loans in Central America, but they were absolutely not connected. So in the same country, there was a lot of money going of working with uh, farmers on the mountains trying to create value-added products like a, a shaded organic coffee and so forth. But there's no way for these guys to bring it to market because there's no roads. And meanwhile, there are huge loans for roads building to get the highway from the house of the president to the airport. So there's no integration of those. In, in, you remember the idea of order and design in optimizing? Nobody's optimizing anything here. And we have to begin to optimize the system a, a, as a whole. So, so much about uh, this thing. I just wanted to give you a little bit, I'll, I'll run through this, it will be really an expression, uh, expressionistic uh, kind of view rather than anything else. Um, the, the Bedouins in the Negev incidentally originate, basically that the, the uh, ethnic group that originates from what today is Saudi Arabia. Uh, they were nomadic people roaming all that area from Saudi Arabia through Jordan, uh, the Negev of Israel and, and the Sinai Peninsula and some then to North Africa. They were moving, a, a lot of those tribes were moving, uh, not the whole area, but much of it all the time. And the Bedouins in Israel basically were trapped in the Negev when international borders were created. In the Ottoman, uh, under the Ottoman Empire, and then the British regime, there's really no borders there, nobody. And suddenly they were bored that they are trapped in the Negev. There are about 200,000 uh, uh, that live in the Negev. Uh, they, are the, they, are, they are probably the lowest socioeconomic group in the country, about 65% of the people live under uh, poverty, uh, under the, the poverty line, uh, very low in education, services, everything else. Uh, 
and most of government policy over these years have been disastrous. I mean, the idea to, you see, nomadic way of life is going out of style anywhere around the world. It's not the way of the future. And this is what's happening here. But the Israeli government tried to settle these people, uh, and not forcibly, but quickly. And there were the, 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 the cities, towns, villages were created. But those things were created without any consideration of the people, how they want to live, what's their culture, what do they need. Uh, without any consideration that they were in an arid zone, so suddenly you need air conditioning and all those kind of things, and without any economic basis, so there's no jobs. Some of those towns, the, the largest, for example, is a town of 55,000 individuals, has about 85% unemployment. Uh, and since most of the people are very young, this is really a ticking time bomb. You cannot really go on like this. There's a lot of issues there. Uh, uh, of the way these people live. And the, the, the half of the population lives in this town, the other half are in what are called unrecognized villages. These are people that still have land claims. Uh, they say, you know, this is where we've been living for centuries, this is our land. The government says, show me your paper. I don't have any paper, so you are illegal. And if you're illegal, you don't get electricity, running water, uh, and all of, all of those kind of things. So this is the community that we're trying uh, to live with. The area is here, the, the center, uh, this is a regional town, Beersheba. For, this is Israel, as you can see. This is the Negev. This is the northern part of the Negev, where most of this population uh, congregate. I would say that probably 75 of 80 percent of the 200,000 live within that circle. And that circle is a very busy area. It has a big regional town, Beersheba, right here, and a whole lot of other things competing for attention uh, right there, not the least of which is a gigantic uh, military air force base that was brought from the Sinai when the peace with Egypt was signed virtually dropped in the middle of all those villages, uh, creating uh, a whole lot of mess. Uh, these are all those, uh, the little dots are all those unrecognized villages uh, and so on. So this is an area where there's a lot of pressure on resources. Certainly you cannot run around with your goats as, as you did uh, uh, before. The, this is the area of the project. Uh, it's, uh, when we started, almost every expert told us that this, this is a fantasy. This will never work. You'll, and the government will never allow you to do it. You can't work with the Bedouins. Uh, you'll never get any support. You certainly will not get any land because that's in the issue, uh, the heart of the issue of the, uh, the struggle. Uh, we did get a fantastic piece of land here, about 100 acres. But as you can see, it's really arid. There's nothing, there's nothing there at all. Uh, this is uh, one of the local ravine, uh, Wadi Atir, from which we derive the name for the project. Uh, and these are different communities. This incidentally is a town of Khura, uh, and the mayor of Khura is my counterpart on that, uh, that project. But here you've got all type of things. Some of them are recognized, some unrecognized, and we are at the center of all that um, uh, situation. Uh, we started the project with a long, about six months uh, process of community that, uh, discourse, talk. We brought a lot of uh, uh, public, uh, about opinion makers to begin to think what can we do together, what kind of project we can have, and there were quite a few ideas before we settled at the end. But we expanded that um, uh, discussion, and certainly this is something that never happens with uh, big economic uh, projects where deals are made between finance ministries and, and the World Bank, for example, with no, with no direct link to those who will be affected. Uh, so, and, and this was a process that took a long time, and one of its product was that uh, principle, that, that, that value base uh, for, for this thing. We also expanded that circle into the community at large, people that were not immediately involved. As you can see, some scenes that brings us back a few hundred years ago, uh, moving from really Bedouin leaders to things like this. Uh, which is a reality that is disappearing very fast, but was very uh, powerful for me to experience. Uh, this fellow here, Ibrahim, was part of the project, uh, is one of the last true Bedouins, really leaves out with his goats. To go and visit him was like visiting Abraham in the Bible kind of thing, where he's slaughtering a little lamb and uh, all, all the things. This is before I became vegetarian. <laughs> and, uh, and so on. So we tried to expand this discussion to as many people as we can to get support of the wider community that we are hoping to affect in the future through that uh, little thing that we are doing there. Uh, another enormous situation that happened here, we began to work together, taking our project team to start working with researchers from the University, the Guru University of the Negev and others. So here you've got a situation where five or, or so professors from the university are working together with a number of Bedouins who are illiterate in, in that sense of the science. 
Uh, and that was a tremendous adventure and very powerful. But it was absolutely uh, uh, required in designing the ingredients that you need. And you needed a few ingredients. You needed a Bedouin community to participate. You needed the, the, the technology and the science that was required for the design. You needed the financing to support all this. You needed the, the government agencies slowly. I didn't, we didn't want to go first to them, uh, but not to interfere or, or to support it and, and so on. Um, we're also very proud on the fact that from the beginning we said that women must be part of this project. In the Bedouin community, as you know, if the Bedouins are the lowest rung of the Israeli society, women within the Bedouin community are, are also don't have too many rights. And there, there are enormously interesting phenomena now of young women who gain some education uh, becoming a hugely powerful agents of change in their communities because the, 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 the governance is very hierarchical and male-dominated and very macho, the, the Bedouin is like a samurai. And so the, 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 the sheikhs, you know, the world is changing, all this transformation is occurring. The governance is by precedence. So these guys are lost, they don't know <laughs> what to do. And uh, they're losing the, 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 uh, the uh, hold on their communities. And into that vacuum of power that emerges, a few young women uh, are moving in in a very, very courageous and exceptional way. But they usually tend to work with other women for women. And we said we want women as part of this project, as part of the project team, working with men in designing it and so forth. And we were very fortunate in having a few very interesting uh, uh, participating here. The project itself, as I said before, basically is a, an attempt to develop a, a sustainable, a model for a sustainable uh, agriculture in arid zone. It will be based on the Bedouin experience and tradition and what they know well but leveraged by um, a very advanced technology. So at the heart of it will be uh, growing a mixed herd of goats and sheep organically uh, in order to, uh, for, for uh, 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 sheep, uh, for uh, uh, dairy products of various kinds. Some traditional Bedouin dairy products are very interesting. They're going out, you can't find them anymore today. Uh, the desert didn't have refrigerations, so you had to create uh, infinite lifespan uh, cheeses. And we want to go back to, to some of this. So dairy products and meat, uh, very important. We are already beginning to educate a group of women. Uh, this is a course that we had recently in cheese making. And out of this 25 women that participated, we chose five that would go to an advanced course. And then they will become the, the ladies who will run the dairy operation at the, at the, at the project. Uh, another very important component uh, is the medicinal plant. The desert is home to about 600 species of extremely potent medicinal plants that were really the healthcare system uh, for centuries. And it's a, it, like in many other uh, parts of the world, in the tropics and so forth, it's a knowledge that is disappearing. Uh, we're very fortunate to work with this fellow here, Ali al who is a local sheikh that devoted his life to learning about those plants. And we are having a whole uh, uh, operation with medicinal plants to create a whole range of uh, health products uh, from soaps and different teas to, uh, 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 to skin things and, and so on. Here is experimenting with some of the product that we'll eventually uh, sell in the high-end market. You see, this is actually, it was very interesting, the stuff that Lydia talked about earlier, about the dropout communities. Uh, here we're not trying to isolate this and drop out of the world, but integrate into the world in a, in a more powerful way. Uh, uh, but still preserving some of the tradition and aspirations of that population itself. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time studying those uh, plants and remember these are wild plants and they, they grow in remote areas in the desert. We've been trying to domesticate them and, and these are some of the experiments that you see here. Question of whether you use seeds or you use cuttings or how, how, how will they do with uh, irrigation under our, kind of, uh, I was going to say artificial, but it's the wrong way. So we have been experimenting with domestication and we're getting some very nice results, as you see one of the plots that we've been using uh, there. Another program is uh, a, a woman-led product. Uh, the, the, some Bedouin family uh, still uh, keep old seeds of vegetables, simple things like tomatoes, cucumbers, and so forth. But these are species that are desert hardy, they can do very well without a lot of water, with high salinity, and they're extremely nutritional, but nobody's using them anymore because everybody buys genetically modified uh, tomatoes in the supermarket that have no nutrition value. Uh, so we're going to collect those seeds where they exist, uh, create a seed bank to uh, keep this uh, uh, genetic material, and have a program of uh, training women who will then go and train women in household to reintroduce those things into uh, household gardens. And here you've got some of those 
a lady is learning how to uh, prepare the land and take care of the seedlings and, and put all the stuff and, and so on. And it's been a very exciting uh, uh, program to see it uh, uh, developing. Uh, at the center of all this, we are creating a visitor and training center. Uh, it's really amazing. We started by an idea that there will be like a little restaurant with Bedouin food or something like this. We'll sell something, but it's an emerging as a, a, a really a major educational facility. It will be a regional educational facility. And uh, uh, we started working with one of the local educational networks. And about 14 uh, high schools from the whole region, not Bedouins, uh, everybody, would be doing all their environmental and ecological studies at the, at the site on the uh, visitor center that we are going to create. So the learning, it, it will have a number of aspects to it. It will, um, uh, it will be a, a, a kind of a professional trainings helping the communities around to do better with what they're doing. And of course, education um, open uh, in a way that I mentioned before. We have this incredible project team behind this, the project design team, which involves, as you can see, a whole, we have all the researchers from the universities, some engineers from uh, professional firms, uh, and some of the people from, from, the, uh, the, from the community itself. And what we came up with is that integrated uh, infrastructure that supports, we won't go into this in too much detail, the integrated infrastructure that supports this uh, operation. And integrated in the sense that we're trying to link all the functions such that there'll be, to reduce, uh, no emissions of course, and to reduce waste to, to minimum by connecting every byproducts to something else. And this is to give you a good example of one part of it, is the, the, the system here, which basically uh, takes the manure and wastewater into a digester that produces biogas that we will use, um, as well as producing compost that we will use, and uh, water, uh, uh, whatever gray water that will be used, not for the organic, remember this is an organic operation, uh, so we'll be able to use this for plant plants around the buildings and so forth. Uh, this is a, an attempt to, to, to this is a model biodigester. The, the biogas is not a major revolutionary step, but there's most of the experiences with cow and pig manures, which is both plentiful and wet. Here we deal with, uh, uh, with manure that is very small in quantity and very dry, uh, if you're familiar with sheep and goats. So, uh, uh, this young fellow here, one of the professors from the University of Amit Gross, has developed this pilot and we've been getting very good results and uh, I know that we'll be able to use uh, that as a, as a showcase, really not as a major source of energy. We'll use this for cooking in the restaurant but also to show to people and so forth. Uh, a wastewater treatment which is uh, basically a, a reconstructed uh, wetland but uh, vertical. We're not going to use a lot of land, we're going to use a system that recycles the water through a number of tanks. Uh, and of course, we at the heart of it, oops. This is the sexiest picture of the lot. We're not, we're not gonna have it. We're having a, we, we have their very interesting, uh, this was a picture of the okay, collectors. Uh, I don't know why it disappeared here. Uh, it's a very interesting system that was actually de developed originally uh, at BGU, it's a portable tank system but extremely productive. Uh, you know photovoltaic cell that you have to cover all areas with. This is the whole cell uh, is about this size, smaller than a, than a laptop. Uh, and it's extremely effect, e efficient in the production of electricity. It has a big collector that uh, concentrates the sun radiation on it. So it creates extremely high temperatures on that unit, uh, which requires uh, cooling. And there is a, a water system that pulls it, so the byproducts, the, the products of that system is both electricity, so we'll, we'll, one of the farm's products will be energy, uh, uh, as well as hot water. And for a while we didn't know what to do with hot water in the desert, and uh, then we came up with the idea that if you process wool, which we'd like to do, uh, you need uh, hot water and you get lanolin, which is an organic, uh, based, organic base for many cosmetic products, which we can use with our uh, uh, our uh, uh, medicinal stuff and, and, and so on, the way to there. And the, the access heat we're going to use for cooling. Uh, we had some engineers design a very interesting uh, system that we use the solar, uh, the, the heat created by that system to cool the building. So in the visitor center, we'll have air conditioning that will work um, on that. Uh, I won't touch about the weather. The heart of that program is a very interesting soil enhancement. Uh, this site that I showed you before, remember how arid it is? 
Uh, it's really land that was degraded through centuries of uh, uh, bad management. Uh, and it, there is an additional problem there that the kind of soil that we have in the Negev is something that when it rains, it immediately hardens like, uh, and I'll finish in five minutes, uh, it hardens like concrete, so the water doesn't uh, really absorb. It all runs into those ravines. That's why you get in the desert those sudden huge floods that are familiar even from biblical uh, times. So we have a very uh, uh, major system of, of uh, 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 program of plantation. We're gonna plant about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 trees and shrubs on that piece of land that you see in order to be able to sequester nitrogen and reach the organic content of the land, uh, capture the water, and also deal with much of the uh, land runoff and many of the problems of instability in these ravines and, and so on. Uh, we created this big uh, uh, temporary uh, uh, greenhouse and been for the last three years collecting uh, plants and trees that will be moved to the side. This was three and a half years ago and this is how they look today, uh, just about ready to go. Uh, this is the, the view of the site. Uh, basically what you'll have here is uh, the visit, this is the, can you orient yourself with a picture? So, so the, there's a main road here, the entrance, this is the area for the visitor center, the pens for the animal, the dairy, all the solar plant, uh, some of the other facilities. The, the darker green are areas for the medicinal plant that we'll be planting. Uh, and all of these will be pastures uh, of organic uh, f uh, fodder. Uh, one of the interesting things about the project, we managed to get into an agreement with one of the local kibbutzim, and they will give us about uh, 200 acres, to, and they will grow organic fodder for us so that we can provide people in the outer villages uh, with that fodder so they can convert to organic growth, they can bring their milk to us that now they throw away. This is something I didn't mention, which is very important. The whole Bedouin economy was, was uh, concentrated around the earth and the family. So th there was no such thing as unemployment. Everybody was employed with the earth. And they were using everything, of course, the, the wool for the tents and for clothes and carpets, the milk, the meat, everything. Now, all they do is buy, basically, uh, nobody can afford to bring milk to uh, market because you have to uh, uh, abide by all the sanitary laws and so forth. Nobody can uh, afford to process wool, all the small farmers and so forth. So we're trying to reuse all of the things uh, again. So these are the pastures that will be used. And this is like uh, when you come to visit in three years, <laughs> this is what you will, you will um, ha have there. Uh, here's... Uh, huh? No living. No one lives there. No, no one, yeah. Uh, no one will leave that. The, the, what we wanted to make sure is that people that make that, uh, we, we've organized this as a cooperative, the first in the history of uh, Bedouin, whatever. Uh, and we wanted to have a group that, the Bedouin are very tribal and clannish. And we wanted to uh, also encourage getting out of this. So we wanted people from different villages and different towns. So we have people from the town, some from the recognized villages, from unrecognized, and uh, no one will leave there. They will all come around. The community is around an idea. It's around an enterprise. Uh, and it was very interesting. In the beginning, it was very uh, very difficult for many people who thought that communities is neighbors, people who live together. Uh, and it took some time to, to get into that. But we are going to do that as well. And not here, but somewhere else, I, I'm sure. One of the interesting things is that uh, I haven't told you, we haven't really started work on the ground yet. The, the date of breaking things are in June, the first week in June. But already in the last couple of years, we have hundreds of visits. Almost every week, there's someone coming from around the world. So these are folks from the Economic Forum, World Economic Forum in Switzerland. The, the whole range, I can't even begin to tell you how many. Uh, the kids from the United States, from the birth of right. Uh, we were very honored to have the visit from the President of Israel uh, last year. And at the end of the year, we had the, the groundbreaking ceremony, which is a very big event for the Bedouin community and everybody involved. Uh, uh, really putting the scroll in the ground. And as I said, we are ready to start uh, work. Uh, I, I didn't mention it before. The cost of this project the implementation, we, we had to spend about a million dollars in this four years of planning and preparation and design. Uh, not, the lead, not, the, not the least of, of which because of all the very complicated statutory uh, processes that we have to go through. Uh, we were promised that it will take at least eight years to get all the promise. We, ma we managed to do it in much as, uh, uh, sorry. At the moment, implementation is very interesting. This is the moment that when the government jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, 
Uh, and under the leadership of the Minister of Development of the Galil and the Negev, they decided actually to finance up the six million implementation costs. Uh, and the other half we have still to raise, I think we have much of it already uh, through promises of the JNF and, and some other local agencies and, and so on. So June, first week in June is where we start. This is the group the, of the founders, uh, 12 founders, and incidentally we have already started the whole process of reach out and getting some young people involved and we're beginning to get uh, kids in the 20s to join that group and that's very exciting because uh, it starts loading. So to round up all of this, a little late, but nevertheless, um, it looks like humanity is really poised on, on, a, on a threshold of spectacular possibilities. And whether we'll be wise enough to ensure a future of peace and abundance is the big question that uh, remains to be answered. But it could be uh, by deliberate uh, design, which is what we need to do, right? Uh, and so we need to really rethink everything mercilessly. There, there's no, uh, you know, I was thinking about it actually today when I was uh, putting this together. That it took me half my life to be taught all the things that everybody wanted to teach me. And it took another half just to get rid of most of it. So it, it, it's a personal kind of a, a, a way of saying how difficult that rethinking process uh, really is. We really have to jettison much of yesterday's conditioning in order to be able to start flying. Thank you. I mean, I would say, Michael, this room belongs to you, and we should ask you questions. Okay, but I would be right I'm away. happy to sit up here and, and try to steer some of those questions. Um, it was just a remarkable lecture, all in all. The project is very, very inspiring. I mean, oftentimes in this room, we are facing a lot of intellectuals and environmentalists presenting a portrait of hopelessness and despair. And to see that there are actually people out there that are busy saving themselves and saving their communities is very inspiring. And it seems to me this particular project to speak to Wendell Berry's guidance that we should always try to solve for the pattern. Uh, and as you mentioned, not to solve for one specific problem. And this seems to be a beautiful example of solving for the pattern to address erosion, uh, water retention in the soil, uh, enhancement of fertility, uh, soil fertility, uh, building of cultural institutions, social justice. It seems to really solve for the pattern. So uh, in that sense, it's not so much a question my question, though, is, to get to the technical part of it, is all of the water from on-site? No. Uh, the water will come from three sources. Uh, that is the one aspect here that is perhaps a little unfair. But it's, 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 uh, it's part of the reality, so I, I accept it. Uh, one is better management. of the This is an area in, in the world that, that uh, uh, rain is very scarce and very small in quantity and you get sometime three or four years without any rain. This year, incidentally, was spectacular in rain. And in April, uh, during the, the spring, the grass all over the desert was like knee high. It was unbelievable, with flowers for as far as the eye can see. But this is a rare occurrence. So better management of the water there, usually as, uh, essentially by using uh, preventing runoff by those plants and the roots uh, holding the water and, and so on. Another source of water, since this is now a formal uh, registered uh, agricultural cooperative, we are going to get an allocation of water from the national carrier. Uh, as you, some of you may know, there is a major national carrier that takes water from the Sea of Galilee all the way down the south and, and, and really feeds all the agricultural communities along the way. And we, we are going to get an allocation from this. But the third and a very important source is um, is an interesting one, and it, it, it's true to, spirit, to the spirit of the project. Uh, there is an open sewage that runs in one of those ravines in that neighborhood that takes sewage from the West Bank, from uh, Hebron and Nablus mostly, and runs through the Israeli Negev to, toward the Mediterranean. And this is really toxic, nasty stuff. It's all the garbage that comes out of there. And the Palestinian Authority was not um, able to handle that issue. 
and it just flowed through that place, uh, very toxic, you know, people who come in touch with it. Through the ravine. It through the ravine and open. Yep. And the kids play in it, the animals drink through it, and you have a lot of disaster rooms. So one of the local uh, NGOs took the government all the way to the Supreme Court to force them to do something. And the result was building a, a water purification plant that was just opened about, uh, started operating about six months or a year ago. Uh, and to our luck, that, that uh, plant is built within the jurisdiction of Khura. <laughs> and the mayor of Khura, therefore, has something to say about the allocation of water. This water, incidentally, it, it, the, the, the process is a very advanced uh, water purification process. Go through three processes. Uh, the water that come out, you can drink, virtually. Uh, what, you, what goes in, you don't want to come near. <laughs> right. uh, and it's good enough quality water that uh, we had to check with the Organic Institute or something that we can use for, uh, for our land. So these are the three sources of water. Good. Um, Shall we hand it over to the audience? Yes, of and course. See who has a question for you? Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. What kind of shrubs and trees are you using to plant? Are they local? Are they far away? Yeah. Uh, mo most of them are local, and they are all uh, they, they are selected for being native trees and shrubs, uh, and those that are, are are good for the animals. And those that have some properties like sequestering uh, nitrogen and thing of that nature, most of them are local. We are going to have a few that are not, but this will be as an experiment for some uh, fruit-bearing trees. Uh, but that will just a, a very minor operation. These are trees that are brought from Africa or Morocco, but they are desert uh, species as well that uh, have been introduced to that area and done very well. You indicated that this was an area that had been uh, overgrazed for centuries, probably, right? So is there some belief that there will be like a larger soil building project that's possible out it's, of this? It's not only a question of overgrazing. Uh, that's not, it's, it's the wrong way of grazing and the wrong management of the, of the soil that was not allowed to, replenish, to re, re, rejuvenate itself. Uh, and what we'll try to demonstrate, and it, it's remained to be seen how successful we will be, because the, the area that we have under cultivation will be rather small. But how to, recy how to cycle the animals on the, on the fields, on the pastures, uh, in a way that will not destroy it. The other issue there has to do with the quality of the soil that I talked about before, the fact that uh, because of desertification there was no organic matter there, and the soil became poorer and poorer. Uh, with the years. And, and less able to hold water. Less, uh, less able to hold water as well. Many rural communities in the past have used these kind of systems of cyclical reasoning and recycling of resources. And um, I'm wondering, um, in the age of bioengineered tomatoes and technology and, and Wi-Fi, how can a project like this reinvent the notion of sustainability rather than kind of harken back to a kind of uh, rural and bucolic modality. I, I, I mentioned that, I think I hinted at it uh, earlier when I said that we're trying to integrate into the Israeli economy altogether. I, as I said, I, I don't think the attempt is to create a, a pastoral uh, community, uh, but the, the idea is how to, ma many of the Bedouins, uh, no matter what they do, even if it, 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 it'll be somebody who's a, a doctor, they still like to have a few goats and camels at, at, at their house or something. So uh, there is a tradition there that has an economic uh, contribution to make as well as a cultural one. And we'd like to be able to uh, make sure that that can be strong, that it will not be as uh, menaced as it is now. And there are possibilities. I mean, uh, we'd like to create, for example, high value-added dairy products, uh, organic uh, the, the goat cheese that will go to boutique stores in Tel Aviv. Uh, we'd like to be able to create uh, products from the medicinal plants that eventually will find perhaps markets in Europe. Uh, so the idea is how to take a potential there and let it flourish in the context of the world today, which is what we have to solve. As I said earlier, there's no going back. Now what is very interesting, uh, because of this project, many of the Bedouins suddenly started realizing that their culture was about sustainable living in the desert. When they were lived as nomadic people, uh, they had to rely on everything correctly. 
like many Aboriginal groups in whatever continent they are. So some say, oh, we were always uh, a sustainable society, and that's why this project kind of revives. Uh, it, it's very interesting to see suddenly that pride, say, oh, we were always like this kind of thing. Uh, and, and we are kind of going back to it, in, in a sense. But not back to it in, in, the, in the sense of going back to a particular kind of way of living that, the, that is not going to get back again. You because can't. Because there are high technology components. And there are very high technology components. I'm sorry that for some reason you didn't see that solar thing that's very exciting. This is as high technology as can get. And the combination of that solar energy with a cooling system is again as high technology as you can get. It's a total experiment. It doesn't exist anywhere uh, there, the combination of the solar, the photovoltaic with the cooling. And we, in, in, we just got a very major grant from the Ministry of Energy and Water to demonstrate uh, how it can work. How are you going to influence the cities with what you're doing? Uh, remember we talked about the, uh, about the sustainability laboratory? Uh, one of the ideas for the lab is to create a network of advanced research institutions that map onto ecozones. So this is the desert, we have some operation in the tropics and uh, we'll start something with the ocean and, and so forth. Uh, urban areas is of course one such ecozone, which I hope will be, uh, will be able to integrate what we do uh, uh, quickly. Uh, but uh, the, the, the question is very important because a great deal of the sustainability related projects around the world uh, focus on marginal communities like this. Uh, this was by chance uh, in, in this particular case. Uh, and I agree with you entirely that the heart of the issue is not with uh, marginal communities, is where the heart of the industrial economy, which is all uh, upside down. So the, the real challenge, uh, but this is also where the bigger forces of resistance are. And that's why there's a great deal to do there. And a, a great deal of design has to focus on the, uh, the whole, how to integrate the whole production system, uh, the whole issue of energy and, and water. Water is going to become a very major issue in urban. And when you look at it, most of the urban uh, areas around the world are totally dysfunctional. All the city, the mega cities of uh, upward of 10 million people, they have no infrastructure, they have no jobs, there's no economy, there's nothing there. So there's a very, very major design challenge there. I think one could argue also that it sets up a model that might offer an alternative to, you know, everyone is moving to the cities because that's the only place there's an opportunity. But I think a lot of people, if there was an opportunity to live in a village setting with some economic foundation, would choose to do so. I mean, we see a little bit of that happening in this country where people are starting to uh, return to small-scale agriculture because the urban options are are hard on people, frankly. You know, it's hard to make a living, it's hard to raise a family, it's a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, so it, it could be argued that it's presenting an alternative that might allow some choice to the, the urban model as the only uh, suitable strategy of habitation. I will only add to that another thing, and that is that I would approach an urban issue in the same way. Uh, that's what I was trying to say, that this is a microcosm of, uh, of demonstrating the embodiments of those five principles. So when you approach a, a city, you'll have to deal with the same issues of energy and water and economy and how, what kind of social things is happening there. What is the governance system? What is the economy? Uh, and these are all the areas that we try to innovate on in this particular case. So I'm not saying that this is a model for life. Where everybody should live like this. Uh, but it's the same principle that would drive the design of uh, problems on any scale, I think, like that. You're going to have exchange programs with cities and Israel? Uh, you know, interesting thing, uh, we were just approached by that same ministry that supported this thing to see if we will actually work with them to create a permanent Bedouin settlement, a, a model where people will live as, as well. Uh, and I think it will have impacts uh, in, in, many, in, in many places and in many, many un, unpredictable ways. Value add in these other markets, but the value has a cost based on your other 
um, structure. So I'm, I'm wondering sort of how you envision this actually getting out into society or, or expanding. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. The, 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 I, I really don't know. Uh, the first step will be to actually integrate that into the local community. Uh, and the next thing will be to be more ambitious. Yeah. But one thing, uh, I think we'll have opportunities to work with other communities, not only locally. We already had some discussions with uh, groups of Bedouins in, in uh, Jordan. Uh, it's something that's moving very slowly, but uh, we'd like to have uh, such a regional project with our Bedouins, with Bedouins in Jordan. And, uh, so th there'll be ways to, uh, to spread it. Maybe we'll carry the cheese with camels to Europe, you know? I mean, and, 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 and that will be a, a tourist trip, right? <laughs> so there are all kinds of ways that will emerge. Uh. I didn't hear the term uh, ephemeralization or through good design being able to do more with less. How much is that principle that Mr. Fuller was so engaged in relevant in terms maybe of things we don't see but over the horizon? And then the second thing I'd ask you, I have a friend who had done uh, work in a seminar of Columbia, and he's from Israel, and he was doing desalinization. They had a thing where they, I thought he said, maybe something straight, that he had something like 40% of the water was coming from a economically successful desalinization project, which is that true? And is that true on a global scale? Okay, I'll, I'll do the desalinization first. Israel is one of the world leading desalinization technologies, whatever, and there are uh, very large plants already in existence that supply, I don't know if it's 40% or what, but there a lot of water already uh, comes from that. Also, Economic. economically, yeah. Uh, economically, because you need it. I mean, uh, that, yeah. that's where the externalities come in. You know, there's a moment where you need the water where you can get it. Uh, now, the, the, the salinization issue is also particularly important there uh, because there is a gigantic aquifer that ranges from Jordan all the way for, for uh, Western Jordan throughout Israel and all the way to Libya, basically. It's a gigantic aquifer, but it's basically brackish, salty water. Not, not salty like the sea, but this water will require those kind of processes and the University, uh, the Bengur University that we are working with, that is a pioneer in many of those desalinization experiments. There's a huge aquifer under the Sahara. Yes, yes, it's, well, it's the same one that I'm saying. Yeah. About the ephemeralization, I can assure you that, that almost everything we did in the last four years is doing more or less. Mm -hmm. oh. I mean, not in the way that oh, you. I would say it's <laughs> is there attention being given to elegance of design and ephemeralization? Micro Recycling, that sort of thing. Yeah, the recycling is absolutely a key of it. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think that those elements perhaps will manifest themselves best in the buildings. The buildings that we'll have on the site, we'd like to be model green architecture or something. Uh, so we'll see how it will come into being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.